Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show. This is episode number 181 with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. How you doing? How you feeling? Mother flippers. Hope you guys are doing well. You're rested, you are hydrated, well lubricated, you're limbered, your eyesight is where it should be, your fingers are nice and loose, and all that sort of stuff. You're doing that stuff with your neck. You know when you're like, you know in PE when you used to put your neck down and you go left and run that sort of shit. You remember, you remember how fit you used to feel in PE when you were a little kid? You used to feel super fit just fucking doing body squats and, I don't know, climbing up a, a jungle gym or something. But nowadays, you know, like maybe a couple of steps up a stairs to catch a train that you're looking to get home to, um, that you're looking to use so you can get home. You end up gasping for air as you get to the bottom of the platform. It's just an absolute nightmare, isn't it? So, um, shout out us guys, right? I'm not one of them. But yeah, hope you guys are doing well and you're okay. I'm doing excellent. Thank you for asking. I wasn't really asking you. I was just waiting for an opportunity for me to jump in and tell you how I feel because I'm self-centered and I'm self-absorbed. As you can tell by the nature of me talking to a webcam, uploading on YouTube for 10 people to see. Absorbed. Anyway, so I hope you guys are well, 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 well rested. I'm feeling amazing. Um, as per usual, I got back from a very strenuous and very good workout today. I just concentrate on doing weights. I didn't do anything else with the with the ex with the um, hope that later on I'm going to go for a run. So basically, what I did today, I did um, five deadlifts, I did uh, five bench presses, and I also did three squats. I was able. I wasn't. I don't think I've as I said before. I don't think I've ever used a bench press machine in my gym without somebody asking me how long I've got. Any other machine I use in the gym, I never get any questions. You pick up a barbell, no questions. You pick up a kettlebell, no questions. You're using the pull-up rack, no question. Um, you're using the squat rack, no question. Or the squat, the pull-up rig, the squat rack, yeah, you no know, questions. The moment you get on the bench press is the moment someone's like, hey, bro, hey, bro, hey, bro, hey, bro. Not your bro. Stand back and wait for me to finish, right? That's it, simple. The only times I've ever come up somebody and said something is when they're purposely just wasting time, right? They're just sitting there on their phone for ages in between sets. Like, you know, most sets, um, when you're doing them, you have to kind of rest, I don't know, between 30 to two seconds, 30 to a minute or something, 30 seconds to like maybe a minute and a half. That's it, max. And they're just sitting there on their phone browsing in the internet. And the problem with social media isn't, the problem with social media is not really their fault. The problem with social media is that it's designed in a way where you can never just check in. Once you check in once, you're just going to start checking, oh, let's look at this. Let's look at that. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. Let's look at this. And then by the time you realize that you're already on the bench for three minutes wasting time. So if anything, I'm just reminding you that there's other people in the gym that also need to use the equipment. So could you just hurry up, please, por favor, mister? And sometimes they hurry up. Sometimes they don't, which is always a bit annoying in that respect. But, you know, what can you do? What can you bloody do? But yeah, I went to the gym today. I had a really good workout. I kind of got the volume mic up a little bit. Does it, does it sound weird for you guys listening? If anyone's listening and the volume sounds weird, let me know. But I had to kind of pull up a little bit because I listened to it from my own earphones. It sounded a bit shitty. It sounded like a Spotify music. Spotify music, why is it so quiet, man? Like, it's so annoying how quiet Spotify music is. It doesn't, like, I mean, you have to really ramp up all the EQs on the back, on the flipping settings page, and then that distorts the sound. I think I just need to get better headphones, isn't it? essentially. I think that's, that's what needs to be done. I have to get the headphones that everyone and a couple of my friends have, the fucking Bose noise cancelling headphones, and then I'll be able to, you know, cancel out the entire world. But I'm just not. Whenever I see people wearing noise cancelling earphones, I always get a little bit like I'm thinking, is that a good thing to do? Should you be can should you be trying to should you be trying to walk around London not hearing anything around you? That probably isn't the right they probably shouldn't be doing that, right? You probably should be aware of your surroundings. It's bad enough when I'm walking to the gym or going out or whatever I'm doing, and I see people, you know, in the morning, I, I guess everyone's rousing their shit or getting getting their emails off, whatever they may be doing, or starting work early. I don't know what they're doing, but it's always, there's always a feeling like, especially after work, there's always a lot more zombies walking around the street, right? Because most of the time people have woken up and they don't want to go to work, so they're already tired. And then you've got the people who are walking to work and they're trying to, you know, multitask by using their phone. So they're always the ones that are um, going to be susceptible to walking into me as I'm walking to the gym because they're not looking where they're going. Um, and I'm obviously not going to move because, you know, wh wh why should I move if you're not looking up? Like, you should move because you should be looking up. Simple as that. Um, I'm not the bigger dude, but fuck it. You move. Um... So that happens quite regularly, and I'm sure if I get the Bose no noise cancelling noise cancelling headphones, I'm gonna have the same probably the same issue I think going forward. I don't necessarily want to do it, but I think it might be a good option to do. Um, I know my guy Mike Marcus Brownlee had a pair. Let me just check if he had made the review on them, but I think I might have to get a pair, man. I think so. Um, there's been too much hype spoken about them. Everyone's kind of getting on top of these fucking headphones and saying how good they are. Ba 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 ba. Let me see if I can find them. Yeah, there he is. Um, oh, he did it, did it two years ago. Mama Mia. All right, Marquise. There's these are the Sony ones that everyone's talking about, right? 
So let me let me quickly play the video for the for the what you call it. Let me just quickly play this review and see what they were saying about the about the Bose ones, and then we can carry on from there. But I hope you guys have been all right. Anyway, it's been a pretty good day today, isn't it? Weather wise, um, today's what Wednesday morning. Um, it's roughly about eight something in the morning, right? Um, the weather's pretty nice. Um, sun is shining. We're gonna be into summer very soon for all you festival goers and stuff. This is probably the time that you're looking for most forward to. As I mentioned the other day, we've got what it's Good Friday, Easter weekend this weekend. That that'll be a good time to chill and have a good time. You know what my favorite time is for um the, my favorite um days in Easter. Uh, the day after Easter, right? The that Monday. Um, no, sorry, that Tuesday when you go back to work. That's my that's the, my most favorite time ever. Yeah, yeah, my most favorite time ever. You know why? Because all the Easter eggs go back on, go on sale because, you know, they're obviously, you know, the time has gone now. They all go, they all get slashed by like, I don't know, half price, 70%. It's going to be nuts. So I can't wait to buy like seven Easter eggs and just have them stocked up for my cheat day on Saturday. It's going to be immense. Oh, talking about diet, I've been pretty good actually. I've been, um, I've been a 16 hour fasting. Today, I, last, today I'm going to eat one meal a day. Yesterday, I ate one meal a day. I just had a massive breakfast today. I had like four eggs, a couple of sausages, um, some spring onions on top, a bit of spinach, uh, black coffee, and that's basically it, right? I'm going to have that for the, and then that probably again tomorrow. If I feel a bit peckish, I've got some chicken I can nibble into. Um, need to find, I need to find an alternative to my uh, chicken Caesar salad that I'm always making because it's just getting so tiresome to make now. I fucking hate the taste of it. Need to find something different. Um, but yeah, that's been pretty good. Using the app Zero that I've been recommending to everyone that I speak to. Let me get it here and see what I tell you about it. Um, ba -ba -bum. Delete this. Hey, da -da -da -da. There we go. It's this app here called Zero. I'm sure you're going to scream people watching on the screen, but this is the app I use. So I've I broke my fast. Then, right, Jeremy, you know I mean? that's the app that I use, and then I use that, and you basically could trap your dieting. I mean, sorry, your 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 intermittent fasting throughout the day. Essentially, you just open the app up, you pick what kind of plan you want to do. I'm doing a sixteen eight, so you do sixteen hours of uh of fasting, eight hours of eating, eight hour eating cycle window, whatever. So whenever you wake up and you have your first meal, just start counting, counting it down eight hours, and then whenever you have, and then when that time reaches, you then start your sixteen. I usually get my eating done within the five or six. I don't usually need the whole eight, especially if I'm eating one meal a day. And it's been pretty good actually. Like I've not really had any um, preconditions to be nibbly. I don't get, I don't get, um, yeah, I don't really have the nibbles. Only if it or the munchies, sorry, the nibbles. Ugh, that sounds disgusting, isn't it? I don't really have the munchies, but I think I'm, I, I mentioned a few times. I, I heard actually Kevin Hart mentioned it, which was quite funny to hear, but I think I'm okay um, with this dieting thing. I get it's easy for me to do. I just need to be strict with myself Monday to Friday. Sometimes, you know, you end up you know, buying a chocolate when you go, or go to the shop to buy a salad like an idiot because you're a psycho for sweets. But I usually, I usually find it very easy to kind of tap into diets, basically, basically because I'm not the most. Um, fanatical when it comes to food i'm not, I'm not a, i wouldn't describe myself as a foodie at all i might go to a couple of restaurants um that are in the news or i've read in a review just to kind of check them out i might write a review online i might post a meal i'm eating on fucking instagram but i'm not necessarily somebody that's going out seeking these new places to go eat seeking new experiences checking out recipes following all the instagram food bloggers out there or food um accounts out there like i'm not really bothered about that it, it, even if i'm thinking about it now when i watch a uh, vice munchies um the favorite the most my favorite one that i like to watch on um on that program on that youtube channel is chef's night out and that's because of the industry that's because of you know i get a little bit of inspiration because these guys are usually quite young and usually within my kind of age group or in my scene and they're doing cool interesting things in the culinary world and then they have all the other friends that come and meet them at their restaurant and who are also doing other things within the creative or cultural world and then they go out together and get fucking smashed. So it always kind of makes me a bit jealous, right? Because I don't really have that big a group of friends. I always imagine if I had my own restaurant, I'd probably invite three people, right? The missus and maybe Bobby. You know what I mean, it, that'll be it. There'll be like three people there. But um, um, I get quite um, I get quite um, I just get inspired by the industry. I'm not really that bothered about the meals and stuff. I don't really watch any of the videos that has to do with cooking. Oh, how to do how to do that? I don't really give a shit. So I think it makes it easy for me to get into diets because essentially a diet is like you know it's my godsend really because it just structures my day even better. And make sure that I don't um, veer off the fucking uh, course when I'm, I'm eating throughout the day. Anyway, back onto the Bose headphones. Let's see what they what Marquise Brownlee said about them. But I do remember him having a little video talking about them, innit? Let's play a bit of it now. Hey, what is up, guys? I'm KBHD here. What up, and guys? This is the Bose Quiet Comfort 35, the QC35s. These are the successor 
to, I guess, pretty much the gold standard for premium noise-canceling headphones at this point. Now, in a pair of really premium noise-canceling headphones, you look for a couple things. Build quality, comfort, sound quality, and then, of course, how good the noise cancellation actually is. Now, build quality is just fine here. It's nearly identical to the QC25s. They're a pretty overall lightweight pair of plastic built headphones. Nice, I pretty like that. flexible. The flexible stretch quite a bit. makes them so comfortable that nice. they're so light and flexible. And along with the super soft foam on the top band and the super soft leather ear cushions that go over your ears, all of this combines together to make them really comfortable. If anything, the QC35s are just a little bit heavier than the 25s since there's now a small rechargeable battery in them now, but nice. you probably won't notice that. So wearing these headphones for long periods of time like a long flight is still no problem. Comfort is a huge plus for these. Now, since they're wireless, you do have a couple other things to worry about, and those are the controls and battery life. Controls have moved from the inline wire and mic on the QC25s to buttons on the back of the right ear cup here. And I don't mind these anyway, because the thing I don't mind about these is because they're a bit thinner. I know my brother has these massive, he wears those kind of PewDiePie headphones. You know, PewDiePie wears those, ob you know, obscene, uh, ob you know ridiculously large fucking headphones it's probably part of all it's probably part of his charm because if you look closer on these headphones he's always got like a wireless like you know clip on mic they attach it to the bottom of it or something so it's always quite funny he's just got them on for show but um my brother wears those kind of headphones the bluetooth ones but not even, i think they're wireless but you have to put batteries in either, either side so the cans are fucking just protruding out of your ears they, they they essentially look like a pair of like plastic cups coming out from the side of your ears it's fucking insane um, but of course, I guess as technology develops, even these, they don't, they're not the most, um, they're, uh, how do you describe them? You would say they're, you could say they're, um, you could say they're thin, but they're not as thin as probably they need to be, right? You could get them probably a lot more thinner in the future going forward. As much as technology develops and they start to get chips smaller and smaller, batteries are smaller and smaller, they'll be able to kind of probably kind of condense the size of them. <laughs> you hope so. But I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure there's part of this, part of the cups that go over your ears, there is a rationale behind them being that big where... If they're noise cancelling, they have to kind of envelope your ears so much. Uh, I guess right, they have to kind of um, completely cover your earlobe. So they might always, they will always have to be a certain size. I'd imagine, right? You, they, I, I can't imagine a time where there's going to be like a saucer over the back of your ear where you can just have that as part of your headphones. But again, like I mentioned, I think I'm have to go in and get a pair of these um, just because I want to have better sound quality in the music I listen to. I'm sure it's mostly less to do with Spotify because whenever I put in a, my wide headphones, I listen to Spotify music and then I switch back to stuff I've downloaded off my actual iTunes. The difference is fucking, you know, it's fucking crazy. So I'm sure it has to do with um, Spotify too. Um, but I would prefer just to kind of have a better experience with my music um, if possible. Or maybe just switch to Apple Music overall. I don't know. I'm quite enjoying Spotify. I didn't like it in the beginning. Now it's kind of getting a bit I'm quite. I'm, it's finding, I'm finding it quite enjoyable. But anyway, um, I think this looks quite cool. But again, Marcus Brownlee does the best reviews, straight to the point, no nonsense. So yeah, there we go. Those are the Bose headphones. Check them out if you want. What they what they called? Uh, you know what they are anyway. The QC thirty fives. You know what they are. You've seen people wearing them on the tube and got jealous. Anyway, um, next on the docket, let's talk. Oh, let's talk about let's talk about something that I don't want to talk about, but I have to talk about it because it happened. Um, Man United lost yesterday night to Barcelona three 0 at the Camp Nou. Ended the aggregate score at four 0 I'm gonna be completely honest and tell you that I didn't watch the game after the second goal. I turned it off. I was like, you know what, that's done. There's no way we're gonna come back from this. And I think most United fans were very honest with themselves and would expect the same sort of thing, right? Like we're not gonna come back from this. It's not happening. And um, I guess the you, you, let's put the game to one side. I don't really care about talking about the game because you know essentially we lost because you know individual error because we have poor players. We lost because of a goalkeeping error because our goalkeeper was having a bit of a mad this season, and we lost because our front line, especially our strikers, are not clinical enough at this level to really uh, take us to the next level. Simple as that, right? Cool. So um, the problems that we have at United are quite broad and very deep, and will require a. a um, a real ruthless edge to him, right? A real ruthless kind of summer. Because essentially what we have, I think someone mentioned it with the back four, we have four players that were playing in defence that played in 2011 when we played FC Basel and we got spanked, right? And usually in most European clubs or in most European clubs, whenever you get spanked in the Champions League um, by a lesser known team, you, it's usually the sign that that team that you put out needs to be revamped, right? You need to buy new players. You need to get rid of the ones that are there already. Like, that's the sign of it. It's sort of like similar when um, 
when a team, especially a host nation or you know a team that's that's going to be that's tipped as being the favourites in the World Cup or in the Euros, goes out in one of the early rounds. Everyone pays a price. The manager immediately gets sacked or has to walk. The players that were instrumental in that team might get turned over. They might promote some youngsters. Like everyone's to blame because they can't afford to wait around to people to get better because Euros only comes around what every two years. Uh, World Cups every four years. There's not enough time for you to just wait around for that thing to have for that team to get better. And the European football is sort of heading in the same direction because essentially most of the big clubs are getting richer. Most of the clubs that are just below the big clubs are also getting richer. And the money from the TV rights, the streaming to whatever it may be, is just pouring into football clubs. Pouring in, like essentially pouring in. Um, you could even look at stuff like fan channels. Fan channels have effectively created a new uh, media, um, quote, uh, hash media quote-unquote revenue stream for most clubs right uh, some clubs that didn't have a media um, angle or weren't really concentrating on getting stuff out on the internet or getting our stuff on social just by having a i'd imagine if imagine somebody set up a fan channel for clapton right the team around the corner what would essentially happen there was that the clapton football car might see oh shit this guy's doing all this work anyway why don't we just hire him as a freelancer get him on a retainer and just get him to do it anyway for us on our basis then we don't have to do anything because he's already got all the equipment he can upload it cool then what does that do? That then increases the reach of Clapton FC on social media. People start talking about it. You end up uh, bringing in a revenue stream for the people that you're talking to on the channel. They end up getting a bit of popularity. They end up being the next, I don't know, the Clapton DT, the Clapton version of DT or something like that from AF, AFTV. And it continues. And then that's the media arm gets stronger. The club gets some more, more revenue for the eyes that are coming to the stadium. Blah, 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 blah. Cyclical, right? So essentially all clubs are getting rich. Um... And when all clubs get rich, the stakes are a lot higher because if a club gets relegated, that money dwindles. If a club misses out on winning a particular trophy, money goes. If a club doesn't finish a particular place on the table, money goes. If the club doesn't progress in a certain round of Champions League, money goes. It's all, 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 all very, very cutthroat. But I think United have been quite lucky in recent years where we've kind of got away with murder right we've kind of been able to spend obscene amount of money on players that probably shouldn't be on the money they're in they're on sorry for instance um i think i heard that marcus rojo is on more money than harry kane right and again tottenham tottenham's pay structure is a lot more rigid and a lot more and a lot more professional and maybe a lot more um f with a future in mind than united's are right we know uh what's his name uh, the the I forgot his name is Casey, but the, the, the Tottenham's chairman doesn't fuck around, right? He takes business very seriously. So to hear that Marcus Rojo is a lot more money than Harry Kane, a player that you know essentially people would be happy to pay a hundred million plus for, a player that most clubs would be happy to give him two hundred grand a week as a minimum to have in a week. So have somebody like uh, Marcus Rojo who's eternally injured, eternally inconsistent, not very not not a very good defender to earn that kind of money, much money is fucking ridiculous. So you've got that issue. You've got players that are subpar on big money. Then you've got the players that are talented, the ones that we buy who are like big ticket players who kind of in essentially have to rely a lot on the players around them. If they don't have a good team around them, they're going to be shit. For instance, Martial. If you put Martial in Juventus, he's going to score 20 goals a season. You just know it, right? He needs a good team to play. They don't... I don't think... I was thinking the other day, they don't make players like Steven Gerrard, like Lampard, like Paul Scholes, like Roy Keane, like Vieira... They don't make those players anymore. They don't exist in this current day and age. I'm not sure what it is, but they don't exist. Those players that can drag a whole team through. Like um, like a Hazard, for instance. Hazard has probably done it in spurts and, in spits and spans, right? It's, it's all in short bursts. He doesn't really do it consistently. But Hazard, for instance, like if Chelsea did don't have Hazard, where would they be in the league, right? You have to kind of always think about that sort of stuff because he has literally saved them um, or got them results just for his own individual brilliance. But we don't necessarily have those players anymore. We have players nowadays who have to be in a good team to play well. Like, there's there's no doubt in my mind if Neymar played for Man United, he'd be horrible, right? Because he can't do it on his own. He needs good players around him. They need to have good players. Like, if you mentioned, if you put Martial, Pogba, uh, Fred, these kind of players in Barcelona, they'd shine, right? they look amazing because you need good players around. You need players that are going to play into your strengths. Same like with the players in Man City. A lot of those players like Gundogan, you put them in Wolves, you put them in, I don't know, Everton, you put them in teams that are a little bit maybe dysfunctional where the, play, the style of play doesn't really suit them. You won't see the best out of them. So we've wasted a lot of money on players who don't necessarily have that main identity of being able to drag a team through because we kind of always had that kind of captain guy that did that, right? From Roy Keane to the Mark Hughes to Steve Bruce. We had those kind of leaders that kind of dragged the whole team through. That's kind of progressed. We don't have that anymore. We have players that need someone around them to play well, but then the players that they need to play well aren't there. 
And then we have a really aging squad too that, you know, we have these weird discrepancy with age. It's just a whole, it's a whole entire mess. But essentially we have to be very ruthless and say that that defense has been there since FC Basel needs to go, right? So there's, I don't know, that, that whole back line, you can have a reason to get rid of everyone on that back line, right? They could all be replaced and no one will complain. Even Victor Lindelof, who I've been a big fan of this season, has really stepped up and kind of shown that he has the ability, he has the potential to be a very good squad player or or actually a really good te- a really good uh, first teamer right he's as good as um matip who plays alongside virgil van dyke but matip needs a virgil van dyke right when you had Mat- when you had matip and lovren playing in defense for liverpool they conceded loads of mistakes they conceded loads of silly goals because you know they're both of the same level not very much no no one's a big leader there that's going to drag the team through so we could replace the whole back line if David De Gea gets a bit disillusioned with the club's direction, he could probably end up going. Then you're having to spend more money on the keeper because, again, people say Sergio Remo is one of the best, uh, the best number two in the world. But, you know, that's because he only plays, I don't know, 22 games a season. You know I mean, the pressure's not really there as much as any other game. Then you have the midfield. It needs a lot of work. You know, Matic, he's probably on the dying side. Um, McTominay's probably a really good squad player but shouldn't be starting. Fred, we don't know what his best position is. Massa probably needs to be able to move on and get, get going. We need the winger. So many holes there and in that front. There's a really big question marks about Rashford, really. Um, can he be relied on to really score the amount of goals that we need? I think not. Um, can you rely on Lukaku? Not really. Can you rely on Martial? Not really. So you would probably be looking to buy a Pierre Tech from AC Milan, an actual clinical number nine who can just, who just scores goals all the time to kind of put pressure on those players. Because again, I just think, man, I've always been like that. I remember when I heard, you hear things about players coming out in interviews, like Phil Jones coming out one time saying that, oh, he thinks he's good enough to play. And he was being quite arrogant about how, you know, what he thinks about his level of, um, his standard of play, right? How good he is quality-wise. It's just like, you know, some of these players have been given false impression about how good they are from contract extensions, right? Year contract extensions and triggered and you're like, how is Smalling and Jones still at this club? It doesn't make any sense. And I'm glad to see that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is recognising this. There's an article here on Sky Sports that kind of spoke about it where he says, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said, Manchester United rebuild could take years, which I'm happy. It's going to take more than a few years, my friend. Um, what do you say here? Let's play the video. But... <sighs> We're on with the job and uh, we've spoken to the players about it as well that we need to get the best out of each other, create an environment of uh, top, top, top uh, class attitude, world class attitude every exactly. single day. Exactly. Because uh, we've got good players and I know I've got good players to work with. And But as, as I've said at the moment, we've, uh, we, we've really, really done well to get to the quarters here. Eh? We've really done well to get in the challenge for top four exactly. but we have as I said I, I like to talk, <laughs> see who I'm talking to so we've um, got a rebuilding job but it's it build it starts with the coaches with the players and then of course one or two additions to the squad will will happen in the in the summer you know one or two we need a lot more than that we need a lot more than one or two I'm, I'm concerned so I'm saying I'm concerned because I, I I just think there's not enough um um, there's not enough I, I, I like what he said written between lines right world class attitude in the training ground I think that's needed because you remember when Ibrahimovic came to United the big difference that you saw was that the players are just pogged about some of the other shitty players that are on our team even like some white matter and stuff the levels just stepped up a notch because that um it, the same happened with Cristiano Ronaldo when you arrived at training for Juventus. How many Juventus players did you hear come out and say, wow, we, we thought this guy was amazing from afar, but now at close Cristiano Ronaldo is like the, op, the, you know, the supreme professional. He comes in, he does his work, he's fucking serious. He stays in late after training to get more work done. He doesn't, take, he doesn't play no games when it comes to his football thing. And that raised the levels of everyone in the team. And I think in general, over the years, because we, because Chris Smalling has been captain so many times, he's played, he's the first name on the team sheet because he's only one fit. Phil Jones plays when he comes back because he's aggressive. Ashley Young has played at right back because there's essentially been no one as sit for the low when he came in. It was him and Damien playing, um, competing for the right back position and out of Damien and Ashley Young, even Ashley Young is fucking terrible. You're always going to pick Ashley Young. Um, left back Luke Shaw's been basically had a, a you know, his, his name's been on the first name on the team sheet because there is no other full back. David De Gea, maybe the same sort of thing too. There's been no pressure on his place. Everywhere you look in a team, Pogba, the same thing. Um, he could literally say, you know, there's no need to drop him ever because there's no one on that team that's better than him or whatever, in um, regards to how he plays. Everyone on that team has played horrible, right? It's played fucking bizarrely horrible, but they've had no pressure behind them. So I like what I was going to say, Ole Gunnar is saying about the idea that we need more quality players in and around the team to raise a standard, especially every day in training. But I just get the feeling that 
we're only going to see two players come in and he's going to tr- somehow justify it and then start playing all the other players, I think. Because we're not two players away. We need more than two. We need essentially two centre-backs. If you're at, at a stretch, you'll tell me, okay, you, know, you can't get two, you have to have one. Fine, let's have one. But we need a new right-back. We need a new left-back, for sure. We need someone to compete because if Ashley Young's going and you've got Dalo, you need somebody else experienced to be pushing him too so he can play together. Or if you're going to push Dalo out, uh, out right wing, you still need another right-back because Ashley Young's going to go away in a year. Or what you're gonna do, you know what I mean? You're gonna promote some of the news, but you still need to have left back then to promote, then you still need two or three. Then midfield, you need probably two or three too, in that regard, because you know, Matic's gonna probably go. You need somebody to challenge McTominay, you need a replacement for Matic. Then up front, you probably need two as well, because Lukaku's not gonna be happy playing on the bench. Rashford's probably not gonna be someone you can rely on, and Marshall's attitude swings around about. So you still need six players, regardless of how you cut it, five to six players minimum in that team, just to get us. Just to get us to be stable. And again, if those five, six players get injured, we're back on the same level again. It's like Man City, right? Like, they just replaced everyone. Like, you just need to replace all the players that you don't like with the players that you want. Simple as that, really. Um, but again, it just takes so much money to do this. And we've already spent, I don't know, I think someone um, someone said to me, I read somewhere, since Alex Ferguson retired, we spent 800 million. So we do spend money, but we spend it on such bullshit. Like, we're... Our, it's like, I don't know where the scouting is. Like, we don't tend to buy with any sort of foresight. Like, Fred was bought, and I don't see any reason why he was bought. I get the Delo the, the, the buy, because, you know, you couldn't get Paris or you buy Delo because he can whip good balls into the area for Lukaku. Cool. Why was Fred bought? No idea. He's a great, don't know, he's a good player. He's been improving over the recent weeks, but why was he bought? We don't know. We don't know. Anyway, next video from Oligano Solskjaer. We did well to get here, uh, and we... Uh... We could see the difference between the two teams tonight. Uh, the quality of their finishing was absolutely outstanding. Oh. And uh, we started well, as you said, the first 15 minutes, you thought, uh, we've we've got something here. And then in four minutes, they scored two goals, which made it so hard. But the attitude was right. Second half, we got out there. We knew we were uh, fighting against a good team and some good players out there. So, um, yeah, the, we know there's work to be done. We have, have said and we've said uh, all along that this isn't going to change overnight. And uh, the next few years are going to be uh, be massive for us to get to the level Barcelona and those teams are at the moment. Uh, I think you surprised us and them with the expansive way you went about it. From the... <sighs> it's going to take a lot longer than that, mate. It's going to take a lot longer than that. And... Um... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. That's it, man. But I don't know about the... In, and again, just look at the Paul Pogba thing. Like, I'm a big fan of his, but he definitely is. A, again, we've always thought... we You think players are something that they are, but they're not really a player that you think they are. Like, you know, you thought he was that draggy through, draggy over the finishing line kind of dude, but he isn't. He just needs a good players around him. Every team he's played in where he's had good players, he's shown. Juventus, France national team. That That's obvious. No, it's obviously the case. So he just needs good players around him. Without good players, he doesn't play well. That ball to Griezmann that he, that he did of, during the international break, that over-the-top ball, only happens because you have a Griezmann that makes those kind of intelligent runs. You know what I mean? Pulls up and you know he's going to bang it in, right? There's no point in popping that ball over the top for Lukaku because nine times out of ten, he's probably going to miss. Um, yeah. Well, what can you do, man? Is what is what it is. We've got, we've got a long, long, long way to go. Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping he's... Um, number one, we need a football director. Number two, we get Ed Woodward away from any sort of transfers. We need a really good scouting system. We need to have a plan in place for when it goes right with Oligon Solskjaer and if it goes wrong we identify the players that we want the players that fit his profile that fit the club's profile and if Oligon Solskjaer is able to get the best out of those players we're moving on and get another manager in but there's a plan in place we don't go and do what we did with previous managers where we just give them money let them buy their own players and then another manager comes in they buy their own players no we have a style of play that we're trying to promote some players we want it's kind of like utility players we get them in right some some specialists but utility players that every manager would basically want and then we then um, frame that as our way of uh, that. That's kind of the players you have. Use your use those players to play this particular style of football. This is the coach. He coaches you. If you can't get the best results, you replace the coach. You get another one. Same like Barcelona. Same as Ajax. Same as all the great clubs out there that are playing great football. You can replace the manager, but the players will probably be around the same profiles, right? They'll be the same, and they'll play this probably play the same kind of football. 
for instance, if, if Klopp ever leaves Liverpool, I don't think they would ever go back to playing Rafa Benitez style football ever again, right? They've already got, they've kind of got their DNA. So what they would look for is they'll go out there into the continent and look for managers that kind of match Klopp's profile. Because essentially, if they match Klopp's profile, they'll be able to get the best players, the best out of players already there. And they'll also be more agreeable to getting to having the players that the football director recommends. And that's what we need in Man United. We don't need Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to go in there with his own list. We need a list to be uh, something that represents United and what we're going to do going forward. Hopefully that happens. But again, United's been one of those kind of things. It's kind of run like the FA, isn't it? You think they're going to make the common sense this choice, but they end up always making the fucking stupid, um, ridiculous choice like, you know, signing Gareth Bell because he's good on social media. It's like, ugh, bloody hell, man. Anyway, moving on, man, moving on up. What's next on the docket here? Uh, 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 uh. Oh, cool. So, number one hit I wanted to talk about was the Pioneer DJM 800. Now, I'm not that I'm say bothered about it. I guess um, there's a lot more hype about it than I thought there would be. It's not doesn't look that great, but there's this part. Um, the story's up on Resident Advisor. Let's play it for you guys here. So, on Resident Advisor, um, it says here Pioneer DJ launches the portable DJ DDJ 800 controller, right? And I immediately thought, oh my god, amazing because. I've been thinking about replacing my, I don't know what mine's called actually. It's a Serato DD, D, DJ something. It's the, probably, it's the entry level one anyway that, that, you, that you get from the most places. I think it's like 150 quid, 190 quid or something like that, right? So I got that to replace my new mark that fucking died because, you know, the Pioneer thing is a lot more sturdy, a lot more stay, a lot more rugged it handle it can take a lot more beatings than my part my new mark one especially because i'm using it every single friday playing at tap east um for the party we put on called taps which is happening again this friday but um i thought this would be the upgrade because the last time i played in some art gallery for a, lo a lovely young lady that i bumped into uh during a, when i was playing at the free compasses she told me she I said oh you should come play in my art gallery exhibition that i'll come i went there so she got she hired a ddj rx something two or something the massive unit that has a screen on it that you can plug your usbs to like it's fucking cool i fucking love it right um i use it, i was like oh wow this is awesome because it's got the exact same setup that you would use if you go to like a club right it's the uh, the the mixer in the middle is the same sort of setup has the same sort of eq buttons on it the, obviously the 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 jog wheels the bit where you put the usb or the you know your cds in are the same sort of layout as you'd see in the club dj setup too so it's a good way to kind of practice on those kind of things because essentially you know if i want to progress if i want to get better if i if i have aspirations to become an actual professional dj in the future i'd have to practice on those kind of industry standards bits of equipment so i thought this ddj 800 was going to be the same sort of thing like a smaller version that you can plug a usb in but unfortunately it's not it still needs a laptop to use it but i guess it's just the upgrade of the one i've got it's a bit more sturdy it's a bit more professional looking it's got everything in there so let's really come kind of a little bit of the news about it so this two general design is built for easy transportation uh the pioneer did launched a new product to its range the dj performance controllers weighing in under five kilograms is super light and the transferable the transportable in and transportable in an optional carrier bag the ddj 800 is positioned as the pioneer solution to djs on the go like the four channel ddj 1000 you can view information like bpm uh loop points track position via display within the juggle which is good because it, it means that you don't have to keep looking at your laptop but you don't have to put it in to kind of play the music which steps uh the two mics at inputs are monitored by a feedback monitor with steps uh on the screeching frequency that often plague microphones in two loud environments the two channel mixer and adjacent decks uh follow design cues to the pioneer club standard nx2 line NXS2 line, meaning skills learned on the DJ 100 can be easily applied to other Pioneer rigs. Importantly, the mixer has the proper phono and line inputs for connecting turntables and other media players, which is pretty cool. Um, allowing the DJ 100 to integrate into, into or serve as a hub for larger setups. In addition to the usual combo of sound quality, color, and beat effects, 16 performance pads can be used to control hot cues. But mostly importantly, let's watch the video because, you know, reading stuff out loud is a bit shit. So this is the video for it. Let's see what they say. Uh, Unmute this. It looks quite cool, isn't it, right? We've got the beat effect thing. I don't really use that. But you probably shouldn't if you use a controller. You should probably go ham and start using the stuff that they make out. I don't really. The bag is quite cool. I've got to be honest. I like the bag. Little carrier bag. It's a bit, you know, maybe a bit gay carrying around a pioneer carrier bag. I'm going to go. I'm going to DJ. It's a bit gay that way, but anyway. What do I know? Um. Used as a microphone, so I guess that's good if you're doing those kind of club gigs somewhere, right? Um, the club gigs where you keep having that you know, stand up comedy, that sort of shit there. Loop sections, jog wheels, playing pause, 
you got the color effects thing, you got the BFX issue there, external imports is pretty good. So you can plug in um, CDJs, or you can plug in vinyl, uh, phono, and line mix, and line out support. Pretty cool to be honest, but again, no USB, so I'm not sure why I need this. It's a convention thing I've got already. Um, artwork display. Oh, that's awesome. That's pretty cool. You can display artwork on there as well. Hmm. 14 beat effects is so it always comes up on there so you can quickly see that. Scratch yourself pretty cool, isn't it? You can do that professionally, you know, technical set quite cool. 16 performance pads. Yeah, it looks alright, but again, not for me personally. I I again I want I think the next thing I said I'm, like I'm gonna get is that Pioneer RX2, right? Um I think it's in here. Let me see if I can find this show you a picture of it. Uh Pioneer RX the RX2 or the DDJ RX2? Yeah, that's one. So the one, the one that I really, really want is this fucking bad boy, right? It's the Pioneer DDJ RX2, right? Um, show you guys here. So it's this one. This is the fucking bad boy that I want. It's massive. I think it's about grand, but this will essentially replace anything that I use, and it will be the setup that I use at home because it would much it would mirror what I'd get in a club set without having to buy the actual CDJs itself at home. Um, again, if 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 um, because I saw, do you see the Virgil thing, right? We did a see through um CDJ decks that are gonna come out maybe sometime soon. If he develops a whole line of it, so he can you know help out uh, bedroom DJs or people that are on the come up that are trying to you know use the equipment but don't want to buy you know two NXS nxs twos which are like two grand each that'd be cool if he kind of was able to do a version of of the one he's doing with the clear see-through thing with the rx2s too that'd be fucking sick but look how great this looks man yeah you gotta put your cdjs down on top oh it comes in white as well which is super awesome um but i probably prefer just to stand the black colorway but yeah this is the one i kind of want hopefully i'll get that one in the future going forward but yeah it's about two grand i think going all in, all in but i'll probably have to get that later anyway um next on the docket what else do we have here? What else do we have here? Fabric exhibition. Fabric are holding an exhibition about rave culture, it seems like, right? Let's get this up on the big screen because it's better to put stuff up big sometimes. Let's go like that. Go like that. Bish, bash, bush. Right. Boom. Boom. Let's do it there. Hold on. Hold on. Done. Cool. So this is an exhibition I saw just now on, on Mixmag actually before I just started the show. A one-off club culture exhibition is heading to Fabric Mixmag Rights. Presented by Fabric, Our History and Logic. And it's got the legendary Jeff Mills there playing with people peeking over. The amount of chin strike. Look at these people just standing there watching him mix. I'm guessing because it's Jeff Mills and he's a fucking wizard. He is literally the wizard on Behind the Decks. But come on, man. Dance, man. Have a good time. But anyway, um, a new edition... It's a, and he's doing the same mixer and the Vestax mixer. I love him. Absolute legend. Doesn't change his equipment. Just use the same thing. The new exhibition celebrating the history of global club culture is coming to London. Presented by Fabric, Our History and Logic. The one of club culture exhibition has been curated by Red Gallery founder Anessa Lee. Oh, awesome. Red Gallery. Legendary place, man. Um, just near Shoreditch that everyone used to go to back in the day. Always put on cool exhibitions. Um, Compromise of photographs taken from the Our History archives. Club culture tells the untold stories in law. In raw, sorry. Vivid, vivid detail from... A uh, world forgotten cities, spaces that were dedicated to. Oh, this is doing. Oh, awesome. Journeying through the decades, everything from 1970s Soviet hippies movement to the inception of Trezor in Berlin, 90s. Oh, I'm going to definitely go check this out. And dawn of 90s American rave culture. Club culture has been described as a, as by Lil as a statement made in opposition to the current all pervasive view that is both ignorant and cynical uh, towards the ethic. Ethics, diversity, and richness of the collective histories. Magnif marginalized cultures could not exist without European collective consciousness. Oh, I love, I love, uh, I love Lee already, man. He's a top boy. Ten prints created by up and coming designers will be displayed alongside main exhibit. Submissions were made by via the dots. The winner selected by Leo and team of judges. The exhibition takes place April twenty fifth. Oh, I'm there. And tickets on sale for five pounds. I'm fucking there. So check this out, man. Um, that's the flyer. I think that's a fly for it, right? Is that it? Uh, our history, logic, um, fabric presents club culture and art exhibition. So it's going to take place there from 1975 to 1985, right? It seems like. The uh, one-off exhibition created by Anessa Lee Red Gallery, April 25th from 6pm to 8pm, one night only. Check it out, man. Five-pound entry. 
It looks fucking awesome. Support these guys because you know, again, they were they were instrumental in my introduction to club culture and to electronic music. Um, I wouldn't have been where I am now, which is essentially you know DJing every weekend in local bars and clubs, going to Berlin to go hang out and go rave, uh, going to festivals. I wouldn't have this interest that I do in electronic music without these dudes. Um, so definitely go check them out and support them. Of course, you know, Fabric is an institution, man. They need all of our support. So check that one out. Um, next on the list here. We have the Jada G interview, which was fucking banging. Great interview that I read recently. Um, I want to pick out a couple of bits that I thought was really awesome about her um, that I want to check out here. Ba, 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 ba. Do, 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 do. Where is it? Oh, why is it not? I didn't write it there properly. Jada G interview. Um, I want to check it out for you guys because again, I think she goes. I think she goes against everything I spoke about about you know Peggy Goon and all this sort of stuff about how hard it is to juggle these things. But I think she's got a really good um, interview that she um, gave with Mix Mag that I read a couple of weeks ago that I thought was really interesting. Cover makes living in the moment dance. I think that's the one. Living in the moment to dance on thing. She's talking about streaming, right? So this is really cool interview with Jada G on Mix Mag that I recommend you check out, right? Um, and like I said, super. I, I've seen her, I've seen her play a couple of times, but again, it's not the stunningness, attractiveness that gets me. It's just how striking she's behind the decks. Like you don't get that kind of personality anymore behind decks anymore. Everyone's so robotic and so like just going through the motions, and you really get the appreciate. Like I've, I'd imagine, I describe her like Motor City Drum Ensemble, who's not you know he's not like you know the most jubilant guy in the world, but you get that he really loves his music, right? Every track he's playing, he knows that fucking track inside and out, like the back of his hand, he plays them. It's the kind of person that plays their, these tracks at home when they're just chilling. It's not like it's the first time they're hearing them is in the club settings, which you sometimes get the feeling with some DJs. But JDG just strikes me as somebody that really gives a shit about club music. And she had a very good comment, interesting comment actually, that I want to check out here and find um, about streaming. That was really interesting. Uh... uh da, da, da. Yeah, so this is the bit of the interview that very much struck struck home struck uh, struck home with me. It was something I was kind of really curious about, um, kind of dissecting a little bit, right? So in this little interview, she does with Mix Mike. Um, it's a Mix Mike interview. Uh, you can check it out. I'll link it in the show notes for you guys who want to see it. But essentially, it says the following: It DJing was never a goal of mine. Right, which is always a fucking interesting phrase when someone says that as a DJ. It's like, oh, interesting, right? That she got into it, especially looking at what she does, being how good she is at music, whatever it may be called, how she's really good at DJing. Like, it's really strange to hear somebody of that caliber to say that. But anyway, digress. She didn't spend, um, she continued, she didn't spend her teens mastering expert blends on the decks. And of all the DJs where we've met, she's the most disconnected from club culture. Freely admitting that she doesn't particularly love living in Berlin, has only been to the, Ber the Berghain twice and effectively lives under a rock. Again, just an incredibly um, interesting young lady. A common theme that emerges in our wide-ranging chat is her succeeding almost in spite of her own attempts at self-sabotage, right? Like she doesn't enjoy being on stage, doesn't enjoy being behind decks, doesn't enjoy being in nightclubs, doesn't enjoy the industry. Everything about it is not something that she's really a, a down for. That that uh, barnstorming deck mental set, you know, everyone knows that famous deck mental set that she played, like fucking legendary, I think. That was basically the catalyst for her becoming as big as she is now. And I think she actually mentioned it on the interview, but I'll continue. Um, she initially turned it down because she hates live streams and only relented after her agent wrote her a long email explaining why it was a huge opportunity for her career. I don't know what that core cool festivals, I don't know what the core cool festivals are, she explains, because I keep to myself, which I think is important. I keep my own lane. Don't play too much. Don't pay too much attention to other stuff. So I don't know. I, I didn't know about Dick Mantle, which is fucking awesome. Somebody of her level didn't know anything about Dick Mantle. It's fucking nuts. Because that means she doesn't watch any streams. That means she legitimately doesn't listen to any other DJs. She just plays her own stuff and goes from there. Which is interesting because I've, I'd imagine most DJs listen to other DJs too to steal tracks, right? Or to maybe find out what they're playing or how they're playing, right? Sometimes I know I check in. It's probably like the comedy circuit where you probably don't want to listen to too many DJs because it might influence the way you play, right? I'm sure... I'm sure plenty of DJs, like, I no, I did it myself, and I'm fucking on the lower rung, but after, after, after I listened to, after I listened to the, after I read, sorry, the Jeff Mills interview on Resident Advisor, the first thing I did, the first club set I was, I was playing was, I was trying to mix three decks at the same time, I was lowering the faders the same way that uh, Jeff Mills does, that little suit, that little pat, I was doing everything, I was wearing my headphones one, do you know what I mean, I, I like, that whole week, after I read that Jeff Mills interview, I did exactly that, like, it happens to all of us, isn't it, it all happens, um, and it's like when you listen to a Gerd Janssen mix, right? You want to get more eclectic. You just want to, okay, fuck, I need to find some fucking deep because I need to start finding some weird fucking, you know, um, 
Middle Eastern music I can slip in here, right? It's just like something that happens to you all the time. When you when I listen to Tim Sweeney, I immediately want to just start, you know, getting some cool indie cuts I haven't been listening to or some, um, you know, I tell a disco music. I don't know. You just get a bit crazy. So I get what she's saying there. But the funny thing is that they, like streaming places or streaming festivals that stream have now turned into the new, the DJ equivalent of a comedy special. Like you have to do that in order to kind of get your name out there, right? Comedy specials are notoriously known for not being uh something that you can earn money on but they usually act as like a business card or like a a, a promotion uh, like a bit of promo material or like a you know yeah basically or, or like a portfolio it's a way of like shoe straight here here's what i've been working for the last couple of years here's my kind of version of funny do you like it are you sure right that's your kind of version of it and i guess streaming does the same thing because people get to see you as a person which is very important nowadays because you know social media and all that malarkey and also get to see how people react to you which is also important because that immediately shows oh people like this person they get to see people like you on the views people like you in the comments like there's all that kind of there's loads of really good pieces of information that promoters and agents can kind of use from the streaming thing they probably couldn't use if you just emailed them or text them your tracks right they don't have no idea what kind of pull you have in club they don't know if you because how many produ- nowadays it doesn't really happen but back in the day do you remember there was a thing where everyone wanted to make a track so they could everyone that was djing wanted to make a track so they could become more popular right that was a big thing you had to you had to do produce a track in order to become more popular then the unicorn started to come out in the way like you know ben ufo everyone used to always mention in copy of ben ufo oh, he doesn't even produce just djs but nowadays, you get that more often, right? There's loads of years out there that don't make any tracks whatsoever. whatsoever. The, most, the most they might do is make an edit, which might be, you know, looping the chorus, like, for eight bars or whatever. It might be something like that. Um, but nowadays, the kind of, you know, if you are a promoter and agent, it's probably best to kind of just search them online, see if you can find them playing live somewhere, and then kind of use that as a touch point of what you want to use. Um, but yeah, um, again, very, very interesting um, analysis from uh, Jada G. And let's continue with the interview because we've got some other points here that was very interesting. Uh, but it's been, it's, it's, but it's been this, it continues, but it's been this single minded uh, determination to plow her own path that is largely responsible for her success. She really cares about making and enjoying good music, not just making it quote-unquote um, says her friend and collaborator alexa dash this all started from a place uh from 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 a place of fun release and sincerity and i know she tries really hard to keep that at the forefront of what she does for that jada g is a warm friendly engaging presence there's also a stillness there because she's not driven by a lifelong desire to be the world's most sexual dj she simply won't do things that make her uncomfortable which i absolutely love like live streaming it makes me feel really uncomfortable she explains gently i'm not something it's not something i enjoy doing the music is a career i chose because it makes me happy why would i put myself in a situation that blatantly makes me unhappy when i don't have to again i fucking love it and again we live in an era where you don't i think if you're Jada G, you've already done the one thing, right? You've already done that one thing. And that line is amazing. And why would I put some position that, that doesn't make me happy? Right? Why would I do that to myself, right? And I think if you're Jada G, I would I'll definitely promote that because you've already done the one thing. You've done Dick Mantle, right? You've got your you've got your little set on a Dick Mantle, one of the best festivals out there, one of the well known ones. You've smashed it, everyone loves you. You don't need to do them again. I think sometimes there's a lot of DJs out there that do too many of these kind of live streaming places and they can't sort of dilute their brand somewhat. Because you just go online and let's hear them play. That's again, this is my thinking. I'm not sure how regular punters are. I'm not sure if regular punters just will go see someone regardless of how many times they see them online. But there's something about um, not having that much material of somebody on the internet. That's what makes it, when you see them in person, a little bit more rich. For instance, Bill Burr, one of my favorite comedians, there was a period where every, like, I don't know, loads of clips of his were up on the internet. And it seemed like in the last few years, he'd made a concentrated effort not to have so many comedy specials or not so many of his things online, right? There'll be the obviously the appearances of Conan that are fucking legendary, but for the most part, he withdraws quite a bit of it so that the, and then obviously he has one of the most best, the best podcasts out there, right? That I like, right? Um, uh, You can check it on, I forgot the name of it. Um, This pod, was it uh, the Friday afternoon? Just jumping forth. Anyway, the Monday, whatever that podcast is, check it on online, Google it, Bill World Podcast. He probably has one of the best solo podcasts out there. That obviously gives you a taste of what he's like as a personality, makes you laugh. Uh, blah, blah blah he has the little segments he has on conan and then it kind of builds up anticipation it kind of builds a desire for you to want to go see him live right this is why when he came to the uk he sold out i think um, i forgot the venue it was but it was a really big venue in london he sold out numerous dates that he was going to because people wanted to see his new material because they hadn't heard they hadn't heard anything new from him in maybe i don't know a couple of years since his last special so that's really good so like, i think with some djs i think sometimes they dilute their brand a little bit by going by doing every single streaming promotion streaming platform out there there's so many outside the bo- outside the boiler room that i don't even want to waste any time getting to it but i really really appreciate jenny's approach by it and i think because you know again i think unfortunately because she's a woman 
and because she's very enthusiastic and ecstatic behind the decks, I'm sure she must have got loads of trolley comments from other numb nuts out there trying to make her feel um, insecure or whatever it may be. And sometimes it gets to people, you know, sometimes people just don't want to do, don't want to go through that rigmarole. It's a lot to be on a, so it's, a, it's already a lot as it is to be in the limelight and have yourself and have people like, you know, dissect everything about you, just what you look like and have your own managers and agents uh, use you for your image and you kind of have to accept that and kind of lean into it in order for your career to progress. Then it's another thing to then purposely put yourself in positions that you're just getting unwarranted, unneeded um, attacks and fucking suggestions about what you look like, what you should be doing. You don't need that. It's already bad enough that your agents and managers are essentially quote unquote whoring you out, but you know, you accept it and you want to do it for yourself too in order to kind of progress your career because there's a, there's a long, there's a kind of, um, there's a bigger goal in mind, right? Whether it's financial independence, whether it's to get your mum out of a particular situation, whether it's to help out your family, whether it's future to have like a musical legacy. Sometimes people have these really well thought out plans for themselves that have a really long um you know this, so there's a lot of steps to it and but the 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 kind of um the golden the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is worth it right you just need to kind of just stay the course and get there but sometimes the decisions you make in the beginning are going to make you feel a bit yucky so I, i'm not surprised that she's you know not on the streaming thing but again like i said i think if anyone if you if you were going to pick a good if you're going to pick like a if you're going to pick like a good um a good one place to go and do your debut kind of uh, live streaming set. It will probably be on Deck Mantle, I would imagine, right? Um, and then here we go. The, I think it continues here. The article says, we asked her whether her decision uh, to stop doing live streams is partly motivated by misogynistic feedback she did endures um, in the comments, right? Which probably people saying she looks hot or whatever, what I do to her, you know, those kind of things. To a certain type of entitled, Al Elberton says, techno bro, guys, um, freewheeling sets uh, represent a Ned, uh, Nadia of modern dance music. Check out the comments underneath her videos and you'll see unpleasant comments about anything from her physical attractiveness to her perceived lack of technical skills. Her supporters characterize her talent sector in the style of great DJs like the Paradise Garage and Technical Profic Proficient Mixer. As one fan wrote on the comments under 2016 Ballroom set, I don't, I can't really understand people that actively comment, come to hate. Calling DJs while, calling DJs while putting them and obviously talent selector. Groove on Jada baby just groove on Jada's smile just gets tighter when I ask about the online hit is I don't read the comments I don't look at that stuff which is good I have a no bullshit policy on my Instagram if you're talking smack you get blocked and deleted later we turn to the subject of when discussed her 2017 interview she gave with Vogue about her hair care I got a lot of net I got a lot of I got re reamed out of that I got reamed out of that out of doing it she says shaking her head why do you get reamed out of doing a Vogue hair care thing it's so innocent I don't get why that was a big thing She's got, you know, she's got great natural hair. People want to hear about her hair routine. I'm not sure what the big deal is about there. Um, but it's a thing, especially if you're a black woman who wears natural hair, you know, it's taken us a long time and a lot of self-discovery and effort to get to this point. Trust me, I know, uh, where we can wear our hair out natural. It's a real thing and there's a pride in that. She recalls talking to Honey after the Ferrari died down. I was upset. All the heads were like, oh, she sold out. She's in vogue. Now look at what she's done. Um, all this shit. And Honey was like, you know, Jada, when they start saying bad things about you, that's when you know you're doing well, which is very, very good advice from Honey. You know, the moment people start coming out and berating you online, that means actually people are paying attention and they want to dim your star. But yeah, very good interview. I recommend you check it out. Jada G sounds like a very um, level-headed and sound woman. And again, I'm just intrigued. This is a very, again, just a, speaking about Nina Kravitz, speaking about Peggy Goo, and, and then speaking about Jada G, it's very interesting to see how, you know, these three women who are kind of forging their own paths in electronic music, how how, they, how differently they're doing it and um, really much basically on their own terms and it just goes to show just how far we've come as industry right people talk about the male patriarchy and that malarkey where i'm sure it does exist where some women are kind of you know left out of the conversation or i kind of you know are marginalized in that respect in terms of representation i've said it myself i would like to see more female DJs play but i wouldn't like to, I, I don't want to just i don't want it have i don't want to just be 50 percent female just for the sake of it i want you to get the best female DJs and have them on the lineup um, and get the best male ones too because there's there's loads of faffy um, dude djs out there but i think we've come a long way that these three women can't do these things so i think in the past it might have been a thing where like each one of them would have to be very sexual would have to play a certain way would always have to be in front of media but they all kind of do social media they all do self-promotion they all do you know, uh, marketing in a different ways, right? In the ways that they feel more comfortable. Jada G doesn't want to do live streaming that often. She doesn't really care about going to Bergheim. She doesn't really go out too often. She just plays music. She doesn't care about other DJs, what they're playing. Like she's very insular in regard. Peggy Goo probably is the complete opposite. 
She's all about the scene, all about being the connector, all about being, you know, famous on, on social and that sort of stuff. Nina Kravitz, a different sort of appeal, right? Went on stage and at the Coachella and started rolling around the floor because she wants to become, I don't know, another, just a re, what's your thing called? She wants to reinvent herself, right, into another kind of artist. They're all doing it in different sort of ways. So I think as bad as the industry is at times, I think you also have to clap and say, well done, because these three girls are a representation of just how far we've come because they're doing them all, they're doing it all their own way. No one's overlapping in anyone's lane. No one's hating on anyone else. And they're kind of smashing it in that kind of regard. So I recommend you check it out. Jada G interview with Mix Mag. Uh, the title of the interview is Living in a Moment. Jada G dances to her own tune. I'll put it down in the show notes for you guys to check out. I recommend you see it for those of you that want to see that kind of thing. Um, what else is on this list here? Oh, I think that might be it, you know. I might be stopped that. Yeah, it's for 50 something minutes, but might be good to stop it there. Anyway, thanks for tuning into X News English Show. It's been amazing to have you there on my back. Um, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. That'll be probably a little bit more street specific. I got loads of street news to kind of get through because, of course, I'm the number one street podcast in the world. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for the self-titled label that you gave it on me. I'm, I'm really, really impressed. I'm so happy that this has been given to me and I'm going to make sure that I live up to your expectations. For information regarding myself, check my website. That's below in the sh- description of this video. It's www.accidentalzinger.com but you know you can just see it with your own eyes you can click it all info regarding me is on there if you're listening via the podcast app check the show note descriptions you'll find the link to this article i read about jada g you'll find my website and you find all my social links on there too see you again very soon for another episode of the show take care of yourself and i'll see you again soon bye